we are live for another episode of the TFD Performance Podcast. We're doing a very impromptu thing that we've never done on the podcast before. I've brought in a third member to join us, but I am joined all the way from the UK by Dr. Sinead Roberts. Dr. Roberts, thanks for coming back on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and Loz, I've, uh, for everyone listening at home, I literally called Loz two minutes ago and said, jump on this podcast, and she didn't even bat an eye, and she's here, so Loz, thanks for jumping on. Never say no, no worries, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> I didn't even tell her what it was about, I, I bet she thought she was in trouble, do you think yeah, you were in trouble? Yeah, for sure, I was like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> you, re- you missed out this on the meal plan. <laughs> no, what we're going to be talking about, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Dr. Roberts, we had a really cool podcast, it was probably, what, two years ago? Dr. Roberts, I looked out this it? morning. Yeah, it was September 2020. So I was in the thick of COVID. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a long time ago. How's everything been getting on from your end with COVID? Obviously, it was mental over there where you guys were. Yeah, touch wood. I mean, yeah, a year. What well, we've been out of it for a year now. Um, so yeah, touch wood. Everything's like back to normal. No masks. No nothing. No testing. No requirement to quarantine if you have COVID. Um, so yeah, it's moved back to normal. What's it like over there now? Have you guys got any restrictions still or are you done? I think we're pretty much all done. Like at the airport, you still have to wear your face mask. And if you go overseas, like certain areas, you have to get a COVID test beforehand. But at the moment, because we're coming into winter, we've got like a big flu happening. So it's like, Yay. yeah, that's that's kind of the big problem that we're all big dancing one. with now. But oh well, it's not COVID, it's something else. But anyway, Dr. Roberts, can you give everyone just a quick refresher? Give us a little bit of a background I don't think it's possible to give a quick background with everything you've done, but as, as quick yeah. as we can. <laughs> yeah, 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 jump all over the place. Uh, it's probably the summary of me. Um, yeah, so I, my background's um, uh, cellular research. So I used to look at how basically me- metabolism, but at the level of the cell. Um, so like pure research, no human. Um, did that for a while, took a curveball and went into corporate world for a little while. Um, started CrossFit, realized that life and nutrition kind of is more complex in an applied setting, Um, was always more interested. My research always looked at the extremes of kind of when you push cells or living things to the extreme, how did they respond metabolically? So ultimately that got me back into being like, oh, I want to do sports, want to actually do sports nutrition and work with people applying the principles um, and then ultimately work my way back to research and kind of academia on the side and that's kind of where we're at now so I do I've got a nutrition coach sports uh, nutrition coaching business so we work with everyone from recreational through to elite athletes um my focus is strength power sports so weight making sports and crossfit really others on my team work with more track and endurance um type uh sports and then I lecture um and post-covid now we're allowed to research humans again um, and starting back into research projects, looking at, yeah, essentially CrossFit type responses to training. That is a lot going on. How is everything going on? Feed, fuel, perform. You didn't even give it a cheeky plug, so I'll give it for you. Oh, Feed, yes, fuel, perform, if everyone is listening. <laughs> How's everything going there? I am terrible at marketing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. It's really good fun. We're, um, we've got a team of uh, four of us now. Um, and yeah, just um, still enjoying working with loads of different types of people. Um, yeah, mix of kind of got mixed more of the sort of recreational people with performance goals or more around the behavior change coaching and kind of how people view food, um, seeing it as hopefully fun and fuel. Um, and then through to the more elite athletes. So kind of how to, yeah, tweak it to optimize performance or at least minimize adverse impacts on performance during weight making um so yeah it's good fun we're um we're lucky we've got a good bunch of good bunch of clients we work with so yeah it's good fun yeah that's awesome and i want to talk to you about your latest research which is in crossfit before we get into it is that what you're training at the moment is that what you're really into at the moment crossfit uh yes although you speak to any of the coaches or any of my friends they'll say you don't really do crossfit you just kind of fluff around and see what looks fun for the day which is probably <laughs> more. At, some point, yeah, at some point i will get back a goal in a structured training plan but fluffing around is um, the current description of how i train uh so yeah a bit of everything which i guess is crossfit just i don't do it in a very structured or sensible way and that's why i've got Loz. <laughs> 
to jump in on this podcast as he is our resident strength and strength and CrossFit expert that we use with all of our athletes. And she will buy a country mile, ask way better questions about this than what I will. But let's get straight into it. Let's talk about your research. Let's talk about what you've been having. You're saying that there's a little bit of delay with COVID and everything, but now that we can poke and prod humans again, you're back into it. Tell us about what's been happening with this research. Yeah, so, I mean, the original question was kind of, okay, what happens? What actually happens? Or the big picture question is, okay, what actually happens at the level of the muscle in terms of um, signaling and responses acutely and chronically to uh, CrossFit style training? So when I say CrossFit in this sense, I basically mean where you're trashing the body from all angles. So you've got heavy weights, you've got mechanical loading, you've got metabolic stress, um, both at a very high intensity and or over a prolonged period you've got quite complex neuromuscular um kind of coordination required if you've got gymnastics in there and kind of what happens at the muscular level um we know from crossfit everyone is getting fitter faster stronger because people are performing a lot better than they were sort of 10 15 years ago um and we know obviously the training programs and the recovery protocols they're doing work for that um but that doesn't mean we know everything or they're the best that they can be and we don't know why um there's a lot of everything we know is taken from what we understand about single discipline training but we know from where research and just experience in the field that if you're combining heavy resistance training with for example endurance training or high intensity cardio work you can get some interference in in how fit you get with the two of them and we don't even fully understand that at the moment when you're doing them on stage two ends of a day or on different days, let alone thrown into this, the same carnage, chaos type workout. Um, and that's not to say that's what CrossFit is all the time. You know, you will do periodized training to focus on one or more elements, but you've still usually got some element of doing tool in there. Um, and so if we can understand how the body responds to that acutely, we can hopefully manipulate training nutrition and recovery to get the most the fittest fastest strongest in response to that type of training as well um and also recognizing that every individual is slightly different in terms of their physiology and their exercise physiology so okay the next level is then okay how do we need to adapt training nutrition uh, other recovery aspects to the individual so that they become the fittest fastest strongest they, they can be um that is the massive big picture lifetime goal um of which at the moment we're observing how people respond to workouts and then hopefully uh, taking the next step from there so is the goal of the research dr roberts is it then you're trying to like on a physiological sense like figure out what crossfit is and then just see how people respond to it is that is that that's kind of yeah. my idiot way of interpreting this yeah no, no it's exactly that sorry i just didn't go off on a tangent but yeah no it's essentially that like we want to see okay, if someone is doing workout X, what is actually happening in their body? Um, so my ultimate interest is what's happening in terms of within the muscle, what signaling is occurring, um, because the stress and the signals that occur in the muscle in response to training are kind of the first step to getting fitter, faster, stronger, because that's the signal that's kind of telling your body, well, this really hurts, let's, you know, adapt and build bigger muscles or whatever or, or more more energetic machinery so that the next time we do this it, it's not quite as terrible um and we don't really know what that signaling looks like um in these kind of extreme or well not extreme but these kind of quite intense heavy long high intensity crossfit style workouts so if we can figure out kind of almost like what that workout says to the body we can figure out how do we get the body to best respond to it? So well, I was gonna throw... Oh, sorry, cut you off. So, so, so I was gonna, that's exactly what I was gonna ask you guys. Is like, let's just like you train obviously a bunch. Describe for people listening, because me, I'm listening to this, my interpretation of the only CrossFit workouts I've ever done is like, I don't know what's going on in my body. Like everything hurts. <laughs> like, I feel like, like it's like, I don't know what I'm working. Like, am I doing strength right now? My chest is about to explode. Like I'm overheating. Like every part of my body is sore. I've like got no strength to pull everything up. Like Loz, can you just like, you train every single day. Is there structure to this training? Like when you go into a gym, like my interpret, when I rocked up, I was like, this is just chaos. Like, this is just like 
what we do in <laughs> fighting, like fight simulation, where it's meant to be just controlled, not even controlled, just chaos everywhere. And you're meant to adapt. <laughs> Obviously, there's a bit more like structure in there. What's it like when, you, when you're rocking up to a gym? Just for people listening that are yeah, like, what are these sure. guys talking well, I about? I think, you know, like obviously it depends, you know, if you are following the gym's program or you're doing individual programming um, because there's a lot of that kind of going on. But traditionally, most gyms just say, you know, you rock up to a CrossFit class, you're going to do a strength component, whether that's, you know, 20 minutes or something, maybe to build to a heavy squat or it's a clean complex. So typically you'll start off the workout doing a strength component and or possibly a gymnastics section. So you could either follow that with maybe 10 minute pull up EMOM and then yeah, you'll do a workout and that could be eight minutes or it could be 30 minutes. Um, so when you were just explaining that before I was thinking in my head, Murph, you're like, okay, we're putting these things yeah. in really long workouts. And for anyone that doesn't know what Murph is, it is one of the longer CrossFit wads and pretty much you start with the one mile run and then you do 100 um, pull-ups 200 push-ups 300 squats and then another mile run so it's one of the longer crossfit workouts um so with your research are you kind of putting everyone through the same type of a workout yeah so what we're doing so this is very much kind of a very sort of baby step on that kind of bigger picture that i said so what we're doing at the moment is is observational so we're um first of all, testing various aspects of an individual's exercise physiology. So we're looking at strength, we're looking at, um, yeah, max strength, uh, strength endurance, um, uh, aerobic capacity, anaerobic capacity, um, and heart rate responses, and also substrate utilization, actually. So how they burn carbs and fats during exercise. So we're getting kind of all the data about them uh, and body composition. And then we are getting them to do a CrossFit workout uh, in two ways. So first of all, the workout has got heavy load in it. It's got gymnastics and it's got uh, cardio. So it's got machines, it's got rowers, skis and assault bike. And it's 20 minutes long with the idea that it'll be, it can't be total high intensity for 20 minutes because yeah. energy systems don't work like that. <laughs> um, uh, so it's kind of, a, it's a grind in the context of crossfit um yeah should probably caveat that when a crossfitter says endurance work they're not doing endurance work like 30 minutes is considered endurance in crossfit but um yeah. like in the context of crossfit it's quite a long workout um so they do it um with set weights and set reps on the gymnastics yeah. once um and then the second time they do the workout or the first time we randomize the order uh it's the same workout except the weight and the number of reps on the on the gymnastics that they do is scaled to their maximum strength and capacity that we tested yeah. for those movements right back at the start as well. And the reason for doing it two ways is we want to see, okay, different people might respond differently when they're doing exactly the same workout. But if we're adjusting the workout for their individual capability, do the responses look more similar? Cool. You mentioned uh, each other. like substrate utilization. That'll be really interesting because I think, you know, there's yeah. so much research out there for a lot of sports and Jordy and I at the moment are kind of delving into the endurance space. And I feel, you know, there is quite a lot of good research and guidelines out there based on science, but when it comes to CrossFit, there's not much at all. So this is pretty yeah. exciting because anyone, you know, that tries to research or find some really specific information, I think on kind of nutritional recommendations and training adaptations and everything within the CrossFit space, it's very limited. Yeah. Yeah. So limited. And I think, and I think people, I think we've, we've probably got a lot, we've got a lot of information about the similar types of stimulus and, and that, but I think it's still, at least to down to the gem pop, there's still quite a big fear or not a realization about how important carbohydrates are uh, to fuel high intensity performance. So if we can do anything to help people realize that it's going to help them get better and reduce injury risk, it'll be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that's exciting. Um, so have, have you found anything in terms of substrate utilization so far in the in the um, research? No, and I would say actually, having said all that, we've probably got um, in terms of the, I guess, broader educational piece around carbohydrates and the importance of carbohydrates for fueling CrossFit, similar to how it's super important, obviously, for, for fueling combat sports, um, is that the people in our study are pretty good athletes. Um, and pretty well trained and have all been doing CrossFit for a pretty long time. So actually they've got relatively similar diets to each other and relatively high carbohydrate diets and tend to 
not train fasting because the time of day they train just um, between the individuals who happen to have signed up for the study so we possibly won't find too much too many interesting differences um, between them in that regard because they're quite similar people um, but we will see I actually haven't dived into a lot of the data yet because I don't want to internally bias my thinking until I've got kind of the whole population um, so yeah I've just kind of had a quick scan um, and it's yeah, it's it's all the, the substrate utilization bit is is fairly similar. The um the energetic responses. So when I say energetic responses, I mean which energy system, so whether someone's really aerobic or really anaerobic, um, has the bigger differences between okay. individuals um uh during the workouts. But I haven't looked at correlating that to how fast they were going um and how heavy they were lifting yet. <laughs> I'll jump in, Dr. Roberts, because you said something here before we came online. You said that two people could do the same exercise, get the same result, but for different reasons. Can you just break yeah. that down? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, um, again, kind of taking a, a sort of a, a typical CrossFit workout. So a common style of workout would be to have a set amount of time, so say 20 minutes, um, some form of workout, and you do it as many times as possible in that 20 minutes. Um, so, for example, um, a common one, uh, so CrossFit has quite a lot of standard workouts that are named various things. Um, so, for example, one that comes to mind is a workout called Cindy, which is a 20 minute AMRAP, and it is five pull ups, 10 push ups, 15 air squats, as many times as you possibly can. Um, yeah. And you could have someone who does really well in that workout because they've got an amazing engine. So, you know, they get the whole way through and they're still breathing fine almost. Um, so they, they get a really good score and you could get someone who gets as good a score. Their engine's not that good, but they're really strong in their upper body. So actually the pull-ups and the push-ups don't tax them that much. So they can do really well for that reason. So you can have two people coming out with the same score, but one, it's just because it really hurt their muscles, but their lungs were fine. <laughs> And the other person, their lungs were probably dying, but it wasn't that taxing so they could keep going because they're super strong. Um, so kind of just the performance or the, the score doesn't necessarily mean that the same thing was happening to each of those individuals during the workout. Mm -hmm. So if we can understand that a little bit more and understand where the, I guess the important differences are in terms of getting a, push your stimulus from your training to get fitter faster stronger we can better personalize um training programs and recovery and nutrition so that those individuals build on their strengths and address their their weaknesses in the sport to an even better degree that's actually a really good point because i think so true you know obviously it's hard unless you're <coughs> love athlete or you've got the time to train once or twice a day the thing with crossfit is like yes you're not only strong but you have to be fit as well and I think for myself, like coming back into CrossFit after doing a little bit of like trying to get into endurance and stuff, my engine at the moment is great. Like I can get through a workout. I'm not even puffed out at the end of it, but my muscles are just dying. I'm like dying. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy. Like, yes, you can still push through a workout, but at what quality? And, you know, how obviously yes, yeah. exercise isn't meant to be comfortable by any means. But yeah, you make a really good point because, yeah, myself and the next person could get through at the same time by having those different strengths. It is pretty interesting how it all works. Yeah. Yeah, so we try. So this is basically, I mean, hopefully we, well, I expect we will find this, um, but the, the idea from this study is to kind of go, look, this is really interesting. People are different. Um, uh, and then hopefully from there, obviously get people, get sort of more funding to do more in-depth sort of research and start looking at kind of signaling and, and yeah, kind of what happens right at the granular level in the body. Um, but yeah, this one's very much a kind of the sort of the gross level um, exercise physiology. So sort of, yeah, lung responses, <laughs> blood responses and um, strength responses. This might be my ignorance to it. I know you guys both said that there's not a lot of research in this. And I guess it's the same for combat sports, right? It's not like there's like set qualities that we can look at and say, you'll be a good combat sport athlete. But I feel like, is there anything for CrossFit? I feel like it's been around for a while. Surely people have done vo2 max testing with these guys they've done a lactic threshold they've done aerobic threshold and they've got these is it could we not just 
make almost like a combine and be like, Hey, you've got a great VO2 max. You've got a great AT1 or whatever. And then like put them through a strength combine and be like, you'll be a superstar and you're going to have to work power. Like this, does that not exist in CrossFit or? Not yet really. Um, so I think, um, I think there's, there's, there's a few reasons for it. So one, cause it's still a relatively new sport and um, that sport's only really ooh, less than 20 years old. Um, there's obviously not the, Um, I think as well, people are, um, uh, it's quite a hard sport to test and do research in because you're like, go test everything. <laughs> um, and then thirdly, because so quite a lot of the studies out there are necessarily quite basic because it's that kind of thing where you know it an anecdotally, but you can't build your research on it until you've kind of proved the basics. Um, so quite a lot of the initial research, like kind of, I guess, if you go back decades in other sports is kind of this correlates with this, uh, like, you know, your one rep max on a lift correlates with doing a workout at a lighter weight with that same movement, um, which you kind of have to, I guess, get it down on paper and prove it first. So you can then use that to build. So it's quite a lot of, um, yeah, very sort of basic studies. And I think because as well of the fact that it is almost everything, it's very hard to get enough studies that you could combine, for example, in a review or a meta-analysis and actually get any sense out of it um, because they will just look at very different things. Um, so to kind of get, a, get an overview. Um, and then the next thing, which... I, Comes, isn't just a CrossFit um, issue or not issue but challenge is how well trained or not people in the studies are um, so again it, it, there are very few studies or very few high quality studies on what you would what what I would describe as well trained to the sort of elite athlete um, a lot of it is on people who have never done CrossFit before or they're stated as well trained and then you realize that actually they've only been doing crossfit for six months or a year um and from an exercise physiology and metabolic perspective um you know you're you're actually very well trained strong towards elite athlete and your beginner are very very different um so and and that's actually really important from the crossfit perspective where we're looking at a training style where you're bashing your lungs and your strength at the same time because we do or we think we know from classical studies looking at strength and cardio training at different times of day is if you're a beginner you can do both of those and improve a lot because you're kind of starting from a base of nil whereas the more well trained you are the harder it is to continue to get stronger and fitter at the same time um, and that's the bit that's the really, I guess, confusing bit or the bit we don't really understand in CrossFit. So we're basically lacking studies in your highly trained populations. Um, so we don't really have a clear view of what goes on when your body's kind of already getting towards its, I know it's genetic limit or the limit that it finds it easy to get to in terms of fitness. Um, a lot of the studies are in those beginners where, you know, if you've never done if you've never run, if you're completely sedentary and you start running five, like, you know, building up to running a 5K, you'll get bigger muscles as well as getting a bigger lungs. But that doesn't mean the 5K is strength training. It's just because you're starting from a base of nil. So quite a lot of studies are kind of looking in that sort of a population where whatever they do, they will probably get stronger and they'll probably get fitter. Um, whereas we kind of want to look at the highly trained and say, well, you're already strong. You're already fit. <laughs> How do we still keep both of these happening? What's your hypothesis with the research? Do you have one that, okay, I think this type of training is going to be better for elite athletes or this type of training is better for noobs or what's the hypothesis you guys um, are running with? So, so this study actually, we, it's purely observational. So we don't have a hypothesis in this one. Um, I think what the study that I really want to do, um, but it's really expensive. So that's why we're doing this one first uh, to get people really interested in it is um, so... I think there's going to be, in terms of training responses and the acute response to, to workouts, I think there's going to be a diff 
uh, the, a big difference is going to come from or t the two biggest factors in whether someone can become stronger and fitter at the same time. Um, I think two big variables in there are going to be your muscle fiber distribution. Um, so type one, type two fibers. Um, and then also um, I, I think that a big aspect of concurrent training or limitations to getting stronger and fitter at the same time is resource availability. Um, so I think it's going to come down to, to careful nutrition. Um, because I think even looking at the, um, the research we've got around training strength and cardio at the same time, a lot of it could potentially be explained by a lack of nutrition or a lack of energy and building blocks in the muscle. Because when you do exercise and like we said, those signals are switched on in your muscle to grow more muscle or repair muscle or build more energetic machinery so you can produce the energy to do exercise. Those signals will only stay on if your body actually has the fuel and the building blocks to kind of execute the directions that your muscles are telling it to. Um, if you don't have those energy and building blocks, we know that those signals get switched off because the body doesn't do things that it's going to waste resources because signaling is still a resource in some way when it can't get to the outcome. Um, because that's just a waste of precious stuff in the body. <laughs> um, so I think as, as some of the issues we've seen with that strength and cardio training is people crash and burn or don't get fit up as fit or strong as they possibly can if their nutrition is inadequate because their body's like, well, I'm not gonna stay telling you to build muscle when you clearly don't have the energy or the building blocks to do that, for example. I'm just gonna switch that signal off. Um, so I think a lot of it does come down to that. Um, but it's in the challenge then, because I definitely don't know, well, I mean, I don't even know that as an answer, that's just my hypothesis, but um, I think the challenge will then become, okay, well, how do we actually make sure that the muscles have the resources available at the right time? Like what is the right time? What is the window of opportunity? And what does that mean for an intense training session where you've got both going on at the same time is, is waiting until the end of the training session too long have you already switched off the signals is there a dominant signal in there um does that dominant signal differ between individuals depending how well trained they are or how on the edge they are with all the other stressors that are in their body at the time from life or nutrition or or you know poor sleep or the training they did earlier that week um so yeah so it's um I guess that probably comes back to I've got no idea. But um, no, I, I, I personally think I think muscle fiber type, so someone's predisposition, which again can be trained, your muscle fiber type can be can be trained, but um, your propensity to um, more easily signal one way or the other in terms of further fitness adaptations and um, then that resource availability bit, I think are gonna be two very, very important factors in how well you respond to, to, to strength and cardio training at the same time. If you um, just take off your scientific hat and we'll drop them on the floor for a while and we'll go <laughs> anecdotal and hypothetical because I think that's way more interesting <laughs> for what we're talking yeah. if there's no <laughs> studies there. So if we're going back to that nutrition bit then, then is it a case of underfueling total calories then to have those resources or is it more a nutrient timing or is it a combination of both um, or what do you think i don't I, care about the science I what think, do you think <laughs> yeah i think it's a combination of both um because you can definitely see if people have the same um people could eat the same amount but say they do it all at once at the end of the day in general you will find like just from working with athletes on their nutrition timing is a big factor um particularly both protein and carbohydrates we always focus on protein in terms of timing um because obviously we can't store protein in the body you use it or lose it unlike fats and carbs which you know if i eat too much in a meal i obviously keep it in the body for use later on protein you can't do that so the implication is that obviously you need to eat it regularly if you're going to give your muscles a regular supply of protein the building blocks to, to repair and recover so we kind of you know that's a well known paradigm if you like but and carbohydrates is obviously has that focus in endurance sports but I don't think it has sufficient 
that that is a sufficient focus in other sports and you definitely notice that in CrossFit as well and it's twofold um it's both it both is for at least from from experience it's important both in people doing effective workouts that are going to get them the stimulus to get fitter faster stronger because they've got the fuel to actually kill themselves to a high level rather than feel like they're killing themselves but it's actually just because their fuel tank's empty <laughs> um and then obviously in, in recovering rapidly afterwards as well um and you definitely both of those factors um it's kind of like a feed forward loop right like you see both of those factors you can see people building much stronger functional muscle as a result which is then going to enable them to push harder and then get fitter faster stronger and so on so it's that kind of perpetual perpetual improvement um but yeah i think total amount but actually i think timing is very underrated still in crossfit let's uh, keep this train going because i like this hypothetical anecdotal thing if you were to i don't know jump in a time machine and go two three four years in the future and see the results of this what do you think it is if someone's just rocking up to crossfit i don't know it's that they're moderately trained i don't know if that makes this more complicated or not and then they're like i want to get as good as this as fast as possible what do you think like oh and loz i'll throw this to you afterwards because you'd know being in the gym seeing people do it and doing it yourselves what are your thoughts dr roberts yeah i would say the i would say the three things that i think people should definitely or, or will hope will, should do if I'm if I'm being hypothetical that they maybe don't now is uh intra workout fueling so carbohydrates during training sessions when people are doing like two hour sessions not necessarily for we're talking about you know your well trained athlete here who might be doing two hour training sessions intra workout carbs are underrated um and they need to be introduced I think um protein at the start and end of the day um let's close to the start of the day and as close to the end of the day as possible and hydration um I think a lot of people underhydrate and um, that reduces the quality of the training sessions because of uh, concentration. Like you can definitely see people just kind of get a bit spaced. <laughs> um, and um, I think that that has, yeah, that that's so vital. Um, definitely see people who are poorly hydrated and more likely to just go wonky and get a bit injured. <laughs> I know it's probably yeah, not forward. in the in the UK, but out here, you know, majority of CrossFit gyms are in a shed or in some massive warehouse. We don't have air conditioning. Come summer, you know, we live in Queensland. It's ridiculous. There's sweat covering the yeah. floor. Everyone's like passed out on the ground. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, I think there is a massive focus on hydration and intra training nutrition in say endurance sports, but none of yeah. that for CrossFit. And um, yeah, those elite guys, even people I see at my gym that now used to just come and do a class and now they're there from four till seven, you know, they're there all afternoon. I don't see them eat once most of the time. You know, maybe yeah. they'll go and have some BCAs or something, but that's not a carbohydrate source. So I think, yeah, for these people that are wanting to get bigger, better, faster, stronger, if you're training in the gym for more than 60 minutes, you need to start eating um, because yeah. it's, it's not normal. Like you don't see people in a CrossFit gym eating. Like if you did, you'd be like, what the heck are you doing? That's kind of weird. What are they doing? It's not yeah. Normal in that space i feel so yeah i yeah. totally agree i think an increased awareness and i guess education in intra training nutrition for crossfit athletes would be really good and you know obviously yes eating during workout is hard when you're running or riding but if you're trying to eat and you're also doing muscle ups or you're doing pull-ups or you're doing hand <laughs> walks you've also got that <laughs> barrier then of like okay how do i eat but also not feel sick so i guess you know timing that throughout what type of workout you'll be doing on the day as well yeah yeah that gut training aspects like you having endurance sports i think we definitely needs to be considered it in crossfit as well particularly when you're doing that repeat performance high intensity stuff where you're just like i ate two hours ago and i still feel like i'm gonna throw up um, so it's kind of like planning your day more effectively as well um okay. but actually that makes me think as well of it, it it kind of taking it to the next level like if we think about the high level crossfit competitions they're multi-event multi-day competitions um and it, even now you will see a lot of the elite athletes um eating through those competitions what you would consider to be i hate using this word but a day-to-day -day healthy diet mm. um, so they won't necessarily be loading up on carbohydrates they'll probably be having quite a lot of fiber they'll probably be having quite a lot of fat um and really it's always mind-blowing when you sort of say to them i just kind of want you to eat a lot of sweets um, for the next three days and kind of if you come out 
sort of a few hundred grams, half a kilo, kilo heavier, that, that's fine. It just means that your fuel stores are top, have been topped up for the whole weekend. Like this is, this is the time when we're just all about go, go, go. And there's even that lack of kind of understanding right at the elite level. Um, so it's incredible what they can do actually. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, that comes from CrossFit itself. Like Jordy and I did a podcast a while back talking about the CrossFit nutrition recommendation and how it's really not targeted towards athletes. You know, they're promoting yeah. a really healthy whole foods diet and that's amazing for 80% of the time, but that 20% of the time before training, I feel like that nutrition recommendation and the way that CrossFit coaches or affiliate owners are kind of educated in nutrition is they they have like this massive health approach and they're almost like carb phobic in terms of they won't encourage lollies or cakes or not necessarily cakes, but you know, like those carbohydrates yeah. and like bread and all those things on a competition day. And yeah, you do see people like shoving down a normal meal and you just think, no wonder you feel sick. It's yeah, we do need that. Yeah. Awareness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like still the number of CrossFit gyms that also still have up on the wall, the really old, and I'm, I'm pretty sure CrossFit don't, actively promote this anymore but still have up on the the wall um it's a very old school classic crossfit poster um basically around kind of the paleo type diet so it's got up there no grains yeah like no grains in your diet <laughs> yes yeah, pretty much sweet potato or potato yeah the pyramid one and it's like uh, always eat whole foods obviously we do promote that as a general rule for most people but um you know some seeds some nuts no grains um pretty much the only complex carbs that this poster allows is potato and sweet potato which obviously if you're doing a lot of high intensity training that is going to be very hard to meet your carbohydrate requirements with fruit vegetables and potato <laughs> last question dr roberts before i let you go and get back to your day that's the nutrition side what about the training side someone rocked up and they were like hey what type of training should i do to get best bang for my buck is it a case of do they just do the sport specific? Like, I don't know, these Murph, Cindy's and Louis or whatever you guys call them. Do they just do all of them? <laughs> or is it is it worthwhile for them to like be like, oh, I'm not as strong. Maybe I should just go in the gym and just hit some bench and some deadlift on top of that. Or what, what's the best way for them to go about it? I think it depends. So I think for if you're completely starting out, now this is obviously assuming that your gym has a sensible program. <laughs> but I guess if you're, if you're just starting out, um, doing anything will get you, a little bit better at everything um then I would say for most people for a, a, a good period of time at least a few years um again this is going to be very very gym dependent because all gyms will do their own programming or buy a commercial programming so assuming your gym has um you know someone writing the program who is a very very good at exercise physiology um you can go very far often within an in-gym program um again assuming the coaching and programming is is good um but then you know if you're if you're at that point where you're like I am not improving um I am sort of just holding steady then yeah that might be the time to say okay well what do I actually need to improve on and I would generally for probably a lot of people say talk to someone about it because you know as with everything we usually don't have great self-awareness about what we need to most work on and depending how elite you want to get that might mean actually you do some testing on exercise physiology so you work out you know your muscle fiber type distribution or you work out your aerobic capacity or your anaerobic capacity and your strength you do some you get someone to you know look at you doing workouts and be like okay why are they dying <laughs> in this um and then um either choose a program or find a coach who will program for you to address your specific weaknesses depending what your goal is and over what time frame yeah that's awesome I think that's pretty much at time, but what an episode, eh? I thought we were just going to nerd out for a while, but I was like, that's epic. That's a, I think let's re let's rebook this for six months. Is six months going to be enough time oh, yeah. to get some more, uh, get some more data and then we'll discuss it. Cause even my conversations with Loz, right? Great. I think it's just, it's just every sport, right? It's like the thing I've realized that like jumping across a couple of sports and then going really deep into it is that once you're in there and, and you kind of are science minded, you realize how much we don't know about it. Right. And we give out so many recommendations. And we're like, Oh, well you've got to do this, but maybe you should do this as well, but also eat this way, but not too much. And it's, it's, it's interesting. CrossFit as popular <laughs> it is. That's one thing was has kind of opened my eyes to is that not that it's a wild, wild West, but there's really not a lot behind it. So it's really cool that we're, we're seeing this research. Loz, anything uh, you want to ask or finish off on? No, I think that's interesting. And thanks for like pulling me in at the last minute. I just think, you know, one of those points you said before about, um, you know, like you can, as a beginner, you can come in and you can start and get 
like better pretty fast it's so true you know you come into crossfit and when i did it, i was the same and new people would be like to me oh does it ever get easier and to be honest it <laughs> never, it never <laughs> yeah because like your, your strength just keeps improving 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 to a point that you know you're no longer scaling your rxing you're doing normal weights so i think yeah that mentality of like okay what type of training is going to get me the fittest and the strongest i feel like you're never going to be the fittest and the strongest because with crossfit that like sky's the limit in terms of how yeah. good you can be it's yeah, endlessly absolutely. frustrating and fun yeah. <laughs> all right dr roberts if people are listening to this and they want to reach out to you feed fuel perform or they just want to chat to you or they want to learn more about all this stuff what's the best way for them to contact you um probably instagram so my instagram is sinead.feedfuelperform sorry i think about that for a second um yeah sinead.feedfuelperform and our website is feedfuelperform.com what if they're listening to this and they're like you know what i'm in the uk and i'd like to be a crossfit guinea pig and i want to get involved with this is there a way for them to do that please <laughs> yeah so any males aged 18 to 39 um who have a one rep max clean that is above 100 kilos can do 10 strict chest to bar and, and 10 strict handstand push-ups get in touch um we are based in london but we are also doing travel out to gyms um so yeah if you drop me a message on instagram um i'll be able to send you more details and get you involved did you just say 100 kilo clean Yes, these are these are pretty well trained athletes. Yeah, <laughs> Full I was going to yeah. say I couldn't even. I don't think I could even look at hundred kilos. Of <laughs> but anyway, we'll wrap that one up there. We'll put links in the show notes and everything. But Dr. Sinead, thanks so much for coming on, and making the time. And no, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Great to chat. Loz, thanks for jumping on last minute. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs>